Thank you all for being here. Great to see you all. Uh, we've got two great days of discussions uh, for you. DSP Leaders World Forum 2023 agenda comprises six sessions. Uh, today on day one, we are going to be discussing the telco to techco transition, operational efficiency, the impact of data and APIs on digital service provider transitions, and the challenges associated with combining service innovation and improved energy efficiency. Then on day two, we're going to be looking at the AI native telco, do not miss that one, and why cloud native is essential to pretty much everything we're talking about here over the next two days. Then tomorrow afternoon, we have three green networked uh, sessions focus on optimizing uh, network energy efficiency, developing a sustainable and innovative ecosystem, and the next steps to creating low power and energy efficient networks. So a lot to get through over the next two days, a lot to talk about. So without any further ado, let's get our speakers up on stage for session one, please. Let's give them a round of applause. Everybody. Uh, so our first session is from Telco to Techco, the impact of next-gen operations on skills, talent acquisition and retention. Now, as service providers restructure their businesses for a future built around digital services provision rather than just connectivity, they must carefully consider the new skills and talent requirements that will transform them into digital service providers and tech codes. So how will this impact skills and recruitment, the day-to-day -day operations, corporate culture and business strategies? These are some of the things we're going to discuss here in this session. So let me now introduce our co-host for this session, Scott Petty, CTO of the Vodafone Group. Vodafone Group. Uh, Scott, good to see you. You are our first co-host for DSP Leaders. Uh, thanks for joining us. Good to thanks, see you. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for the invitation. Really looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Great. And now we're going to uh, have our other guests uh, introduce themselves. Uh, we're going to uh, get their name, job title, and uh, which company organization they're from. So let's start on the far right with Christian. Okay. I am Christian Toivo, Executive Director of TIP, Telecom Infra Project. Great to be here. Okay, Christian. And where have you come from to, to be with us today? Well, I came from Finland last night. Okay, good. Good, uh, good to know that Heathrow is uh, working yep. and getting the, the people to DSP <laughs> Leaders World Forum. Um, uh, next up, we have Dan. Hi, yeah. Uh, Dan Ryder. I work for BT and I lead the HR team for our networks organization. Uh, and I only traveled in from Battersea this morning. So it's a relatively <laughs> straightforward journey. So skirted Heathrow. Yeah. Uh, Cormac. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Great to be here. Cormac Quillen. Um, I head up the Europe, Middle East, and Africa telecoms team at Dell Technologies, uh, originally from Dublin, but now residing in sunny Sussex. Okay, excellent. Over to the other side uh, of the fence here, and Chris. Yeah, Chris Thornton. I'm part of the global ecosystem team for within Telco Media and Entertainment for Red Hat. I've come in from uh, Bristol. Okay, excellent. In from the West. Uh, next up, I think our longest journey to get here for this session, Alfredo. Yeah, here I'm, I am, Alfredo Musitani from Telecom Argentina. I'm, I'm just a sales executive, uh, and it's a pleasure to share this, this place with uh, such an important people. And I uh, came from a long way from Buenos Aires, and uh, it's, uh, it's nice to share to, with everybody. Oh, well, thank you very much for coming. Great to have you here for the session. And uh, Graham. Hi, everybody. So uh, Graham Wild. Uh, I work for Three Group Solutions, which is part of the Hutchison Group, uh, and I look after the private networks business that we have internationally. Okay. And I came from Chelsea, and uh, <laughs> and it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, and to start the session, I'm going to invite Scott as our co-host to the lectern to give our first DSP leaders address. Scott, over to you. Thank you, Ray. 
So the, the journey from Telco to Techco is actually much more about operating model, new ways of working, culture change than it is about technology. When we talk about this journey from Telco to Techco, we often focus on the, the shiny new things, the new sources of revenue, the new products that we can develop, the new digital services that we can create. Why? Because we all need revenue growth. We're all looking for opportunities to, to grow the organization. However, it's not just about those new products and services and capabilities. This journey from telco to techco actually touches all of the organization. When we think about this journey, we look at it from three pillars. A new product development, but these take time. Creating a new source of revenue, getting into the market, winning that revenue doesn't happen overnight. It can take many years. If I look at our IoT business, we've just approached a billion euros of revenue. That's a good source of revenue growth for us as an organization. We've been working at it for 14 years. If I think about private networks, 5G services, they're going to take time to really move the needle from a revenue point of view. So when we look at digital transformation, this journey from telco to techco, we focus on two other really important pillars. The first one is our own internal business optimization, looking at process optimization, leveraging our data ocean, applying ML and AI to everything we do in our business to drive operation efficiencies. We've unlocked more than 500 million euros in savings over the last year by applying those techniques to our purchase to pay processes, to our smart capex, the way we plan our networks, for network anomaly detection, for energy management, driving efficiency across the organization. We also look at our second pillar, which is all around digital channels. How do we service and sell to our customers in a more efficient way through our apps, through our e-commerce platforms, leveraging our chatbots and, and uh, agents to be able to sell and service our customers better, to win market share, and of course, develop operating efficiencies through those. Those two are critically important because if you want to build new services in an industry where return on capital employed is at or below weighted average cost of capital, you need to create the oxygen through efficiencies to have the money to invest in those new products and services. If you don't unlock that, over time, your financial teams will lose uh, the patience to build those new products and we end up in a little bit of a death spiral just focusing on how we operate our networks. If we want to be successful at this, though, we need to change the way we operate as telcos. We can't simply rely on the outsourcing model and the vendor partnership models we've had in the past. I think there are four key foundations we need to get right. The first one is to invest in engineering. We started our move to Agile in 2017 to start building our apps and uh, channels leveraging Agile technologies. We learned really quickly as we added more squads, more development capacity, we actually lost productivity. Our quality declined. We started to challenge, mm, is this really a good idea? Should we just be outsourcing again and leveraging externals? The reason we were finding that was we weren't investing in our software engineering capability, our CICD pipelines, our automation, the tools and the way we managed our developers. As we started to invest that capability, we saw an increase in our productivity, overachieving our business case and the capabilities that we wanted to deliver. We need to modernize our technologies. We can't rely on monolithic stacks anymore. Leveraging cloud technologies, modernizing our APIs, modernizing the microservices that we use to build those applications. Third, we need to invest in open source capabilities, managing our own source code and the way that we deploy those technologies. And fourth, but most important, we need to insource. We need to have our own engineering talent, our own development talent to be successful if we're going to manage these ecosystems of technologies and capabilities to build and deploy. So I put it to you that the journey from Techco to Telco, from Telco to Techco doesn't just apply to new product services, it actually applies to the entire organization. It's about cultural change and driving those efficiencies across the whole organization, driving new ways of working, adapting a new operating model. That brings with it a whole set of challenges. How do you attract the right talent? How do you keep that talent? How do you build technical career paths and enable them to move throughout the organization? And most importantly, how do you manage productivity? You no longer have external vendors that you can manage to KPIs. These are your own people. How do you ensure that you're getting faster and better every year? How do you manage your own quality? Those cultural changes are super important if you want to be successful in the journey to unlock sources of revenue growth and drive operational efficiencies by being your own software engineering organization. I'm looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists on how they think we can solve some of these challenges as an industry if we really want to unlock the value return that we can. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, so before we get right into the session uh, full, we're just going to take a quick look at our viewer poll uh, for this session. Uh, here is the question we are asking, along with the multiple choice answers. And the question is, 
what will be the hardest challenge for a telco wanting to become a tech co? So the poll is on the Telecom TV site. If you're watching online, please vote now. For those of you here in the room, uh, do try and take a look with your phones and laptops and cast your votes, and we will take a look at the results towards the end of the session. So we have a number of talking, talking points to get through uh, in this session, starting with, uh, is the tech co model the natural evolution for all uh, telcos? So, uh, Scott, I'm just going to start with uh, you. Obviously, Vodafone is on this journey, but do you see this as the, the natural progression for, for all telcos? I'm not sure it's natural. I think it's necessary. I think if you want to unlock the operational efficiencies that we all need to improve our return on capital, if we want to move at the velocity and unlock new sources of revenue growth, if those are the focus of your organization, I don't think you have a choice but to move in, in this direction. Um, but it's a big change for organizations. We've learned as an industry to operate in a certain way. We've built networks the same way for 20 years. We've operated the same way for 20 years, and we have to drive a big cultural change to make that happen. So therefore, it probably doesn't feel natural for most people, but I'd say it's very necessary. OK. Um, Graham, maybe we can come to you first for, for comment, as you're from a, an operator as well. Uh, what do you think about this transition? Is this something you can see happening across the board? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, so, so it takes me back to 1897, Ray. Oh, thanks um, very much. When I left, <laughs> when, when I left school. Uh, no, 1897 was an interesting year in the UK because that was the, the year when we introduced the first electromechanical switch in a telecoms network in the UK. And before that, uh, you didn't have a dial on the phone. You just picked up the receiver and you got straight through to an operator. And they, uh, and, and they had the telephone companies in the UK had a whole bank of operators who would... Connect, manually connect your call to, to the caller. Um, so we, we introduced that bit of automation uh, in 1897 in this country. And I think that we really haven't stopped the continuous journey of kind of improving technology and systems and processes since then. And it, and it kind of seems to go in, in a, a series of revolutions. So there was that first revolution at the end of the 1800s. There was another one uh, in the 1950s and 1960s when we moved, started to move to electronic technology and move away from electromechanical ones. There's been other ones, but now we're in another one, right? We're, we're, we're in another revolution and we have to kind of reinvent ourselves. But that's the story of the industry. We've been doing that for 150 years. This is, this is the latest thing that we have to do and we are going to do it. And if we don't do it, then your companies that don't do it won't survive. Okay. Uh, Dan, if, if I can come to you then, because... Um uh, there has been a, a gradual uh, evolution over time, uh, but this is maybe a bit more of a, 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 of a cultural one, and you, you're in Human Resources BT. Is this more of a step change on that side of the, of the operations, of that side of the companies of, of telcos like BT? Um, I think on the one hand, yes, it is, because um, we perhaps hear much more about it. Uh, the, 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 the sort of changes that you've seen previously didn't perhaps get the same media coverage. We, we live in an age that's quite different today, so we assume perhaps it's worse than it is. What I would say, though, is people have adapted all throughout the last 150-odd years and will continue to do so. And I think we underestimate our workforce if we think that they can't adapt to it. And when we say workforce, the other thing I would add is I think leaders are really key here to explain what does this actually mean and bring it to life for people, because unknown is often daunting. But when you start to work through it, feel it, and it's actually not quite as bad as you thought it was, I think people will embrace this. And you know, people in this sort of industry are inquisitive by their very nature. So they want to understand new and develop new and be involved in new, would be my sense. Okay. Do you chime with that? Is, is there a willingness within Vodafone uh, for this uh, evolution? I think there is. I think it's an exciting transition for many people to, to reskill. If you think about, as an industry, we became very outsourcing orientated over the last 20 years, buying managed services from vendors to, to deliver. As we moved to open RAN out of the lab into production, we realised we need to be our own systems integrator here. We need our own engineering capabilities. What I saw from the network teams was a huge energy to want to understand how the technology operated, how best to oper engineer it, how to drive operational performance, and rely on those skill sets ourselves to be our own systems integrator. They see that as a brilliant career path opportunity, not being a procurement specialist, can I get a better price from Ericsson, Nokia, or Huawei, but actually understanding the technology and driving operational efficiencies. That's a much, much more rewarding career than being a vendor manager in my opinion. Right, okay. 
And maybe, Alfredo, we can come to you. Um, uh, you know, is this a, a telecom Argentina, maybe in the, the Latin America region? Is this a trend you're seeing as well? Is this something that the operators are talking about there? Yeah, yes, of course. We, we, we didn't talk a lot uh, about uh, transition to agility. Digital transformation was uh, the word at uh, those times. But, uh, but it was not a word about agility, and it was not thought to, uh, in my own perspective, because I'm not the voice of telecom, just one of uh, the guys that been transformed here. And um, there was not a word in the, uh, about agile, agile transformation, and, and I guess, as many have said, that uh, I think the, the point of, of what we are doing now is, is this transformation. And, and, and in that regard, I think the, the, uh, now we are fully engaged in that transition. But as, we, as I was talking with, uh, with the other guys here, uh, this uh, transformation <coughs> drives many different uh, investment that is not just capital, that is a lot of capital involved. That uh, is a risk killing in the T-shaped way that nobody talks about that, or, or, or at least I I listen a little bit because everybody says about I do everything uh, with everybody. This is uh, this is not an easy thing to do, although, but it's not the the, the things going uh, the things are going to improve. The things are going to improve when you uh, when you know what is the T shape uh, thing. It's something like I can talk to everybody, but I have to know something for sure and be the expert that can give value. To the, to the business. And this T, I think, uh, as, uh, as he told us, is, is the, the things that we are used to do at, at telecoms because everybody keeps on investing. But now, I don't know if everybody is thinking that this T still has to be uh, deployed. Uh, but still, the, the other way, the change into the agile way of doing things, it's also a big change in the mindset and it's maintained from the bottom to the top of the of the organization. I guess, I guess my belief, uh, my my vision of the of the company, uh, of my own company, and um, maybe many in the industry, is that the highest ambition of the, the, the leaders is is uh, really enforced uh, in that direction. Uh, I, I I think there is a lot to be done in in the whole uh, organization from bottom uh, to top because in the bottom the people have feel very scary of changing what they are doing and how they are doing absolutely but there's a lot to be done and it's going to yeah. be fun it's it's a big change it can be exciting but it can also be daunting as well and i guess for for companies like dell and red hat you i mean a lot of these companies they can't do well nobody can do it by themselves can they so are you talking to the operators uh, about these kind of transitions and, and being asked to, to help, them this, uh, help them on this journey, Cormac? Yeah, I, I think ecosystem has always been part of the, the, the model we have here. No one has ever done this by themselves. I think if you go back to 1897, as Graham said, um, you, you will find that more was done end-to-end -end by the operator, clearly. But as time has gone on, as the gap between technology changes and generations has shortened, no one can do it by themselves. You need that delivery going on in parallel. You need that testing. And that's going to become even more important over the next decade as open around 6G and everything else, whatever comes after, starts to roll out. Um, the other thing that, that the new open ecosystem is bringing, though, is exciting new entrants like ourselves. You know, I've spent most of the last two and a half years at Dell answering questions like, Dell, Telco, really? Um, understandable questions. And it's our job to go prove why we can do this. But as the system becomes more and more open, less uh, proprietary, there is more opportunity for software development companies with hardware bases to start to bring value in areas that maybe are becoming more important, such as power consumption, energy consumption, footprint, etc., which are as important, if not more so now, for the operators than necessarily just the telco, given cost model, the speed of deployment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that whole ecosystem is the thing that needs to shift and move and shift and move in tandem with each other going forward. Um, there was a, a, a skills study um, taken out by the Secretary of State. Uh, I think it was called the Skills Usage Study. And one of the key things that came out with was the open system is going to require a whole new set of skills going forward. And that it needs the industry to work together in unison, including government and education, to make that happen. 
That was their conclusion. That was published in the year 2000. <laughs> okay. So one of my questions to the room, I guess, to the industry, is what have we learned in that last two decades that has changed this, what is seen as a normal sort of evolutionary plan from generation to generation? How have we actually changed that ecosystem and working together and, and the environment behind it, funding, training, UK PLC, looking at its skills capability as a nation. You look at what Saudi Arabia is doing in terms of its business plan for 2030. You look at how Singapore is developed as an ecosystem. Yes, they're small, you know, slightly different managed government states. But when you start to take a holistic view of your market, you can start to develop a position in the industry that leads to greater development, greater in, uh, invention, more attraction to people. You know, we have on the one side the consequences of Brexit and skill set shortages from certain geographies that we're trying to replace now from Asia and South Africa. But where's the natural incentive to get young engineering talents to want to work for the, for the companies in the UK, in Europe, where it's happening? The US government are looking to, to employ a whole lot more money because I think there was a strong realization post the Chinese vendor debate that their technology footprint is wanting. So there's now more investment going in in that marketplace. How, how do the markets compete with each other? Should we be? Is this a technological market competition we should be looking at rather than a geographical market? There's loads of these whole things. They're all part of that ecosystem. I They're think, all part of the things that make it tick. I think you've just described a two-week conference. <laughs> call that, uh, <laughs> things, uh, um, but yeah, a key point, I think, here is that there's, there's a, a change to the, to the workforce, uh, isn't there? And, and maybe, Chris, we can come to you in a second to talk about that. But... Um, uh, Scott, just quickly, um, you know, this is happening within Vodafone, but do you feel that there's, you can only go so far without the, the rest of the industry sort of going along in the same direction at the same time? Yeah, I think that our industry is built on standards and scale, and, and we need the whole industry to move forward. We, we, we passionately believe, for instance, in Open RAN as a, as a way to create openness, scale, diversification, and create flexibility in the way we build our networks, and that ecosystem is critically important. And, and, and partners like Dell and, and, and Red Hat are doing an amazing job helping us get a new technology up to the level of performance that we require and, and operating at the levels that we want. But the whole industry needs to, to move in that direction to, to right. make that happen. Uh, and those kind of transitions, I mean, that, that involves uh, operating and working in a different way. So, Chris, from a Red Hat perspective, are you starting to see um, you know, uh, as this move towards tech co happens, that the operators are, are working and behaving and operating in a different way? Well, what we're seeing is the whole desire to open things up. And that needs not only the, the technology shift, but also the mindset shift. And within Red Hat, we've been working on an open mentality since our inception, some 20, 25 years ago. Um, and through that, we've learned that there are various things that you need to, to build that we've been helping operators with adopting, such as not only strong leadership, but also meritocracy, having people build what they need based on their skills rather than any particular job title. We've looked at things like the open collaboration and making sure that not only people can collaborate, but also going forward how companies can collaborate better to create better software. So it's all of these pieces that need to work together and uh, working with operators and other partners as part of that ecosystem becomes critical because we need to make these technologies which used to be pre-integrated, pre-built pre into something that's a lot easier to adopt in an open platform. Okay. I think the meritocracy point is a super important one. Telcos have, have over time morphed to being where technology is just part of the organisation. The way we manage our people is very... Um, hierarchical in nature. So you, you, you progress up the managerial path by how many people you manage, how big your budget is, uh, and they're fairly, fairly generic skills that, that you learn. In, in this world, first of all, we have to rebalance our workforce to be more engineering heavy, so more in technology, less in care and, and commercial functions. And secondly, we need to manage people in a very different way. You need a technical career path that says your most highly paid people may be single contributor engineers that are setting the architecture and direction, not the people who manage a 1,000 people or a, or a billion euro budget, that's a massive mindset change in the organization, the way we operate and the way we manage. And that transition for me is much more important than, than many of the other topics people talk about. How do we make sure we are the great place for engineering talent to want to work because they can see a career path and a progression for the rest of their career? Okay. Um, 
Now, Christian, a, a tip, uh, you've got a lot of network operators as members and engaged uh, with what uh, TIP is doing. Are you seeing uh, a, a shift in the, the workforces that, that certain operators who are sort of making this transition early, are you seeing a shift in what they're doing and how they're interacting with TIP as well? Yeah, so absolutely. First of all, I think um, <clears throat> everything that was said before about the need to transform and what is driving it <clears throat> is clearly visible in the day-to-day -day work we do within TIP, which involves a big number of operators, but also vendors and system integrators alike. And um, of course, you know, might be a bit biased because the, the folks that engage with us are already on that journey to transform. Uh, but like in any transformation, you need, you need the ways to, con you need to show the way. And, and as was said by somebody here, ecosystem approach and working together is essential to not just show the way, but also create that scale, which is not just about the technology, but the transformation. And uh, I certainly agree that there's no, there's no way back on this because the technology is already changing. And I, I mentioned to somebody, I had a fortunate opportunity to spend some time in the IT industry and cloud transformation. And I think what we see in front of us in the telco space is very similar to cloud transformation in enterprise IT. And the only way to deal with that is to get your hands dirty and also dare to do those, start to do those changes. Because even if you might not necessarily want to kind of become a tech co in the sense that you want to kind of transform everything in your business, you might just want to run your network more efficiently, you still need to kind of have a grip on what the new technology provides to you. So yes, Ray, we see that. And I think everything that was said is kind of showing that we are moving in that direction. Okay. Dan, what does this mean for the, the, the shape and makeup of a workforce in a, in a company uh, as large as BT? How quickly can that change and has it started to change? Uh, I mean, it's a great question how quickly it can change. Uh, it's, in the size and scale, it's really difficult actually to create some of that change because you have to do a bit of both the culture first and some of the forced change that's going to help people on that journey. I think that um, it, it's absolutely true that we've got to start looking at our technical skills in a different way and, and equal value, actually, to some of the scale leadership and demonstrate that that is something that we're willing to do as an organization, and we certainly are starting to do that. Uh, we've more to do in that space. I think also from an early careers perspective, we've got to demonstrate to people they can come and have a, a career in an organization and an industry that means they will move around, and that's okay because people often don't want that job for life. But actually, if you treat them really well and if you develop them, um, in the technical areas that they really are interested in doing and don't perhaps force them to diversify and force them to go into things like management or leadership if they don't want to. Some of our longest tenure in new joiners is in our early careers because we've created that ecosystem where they want to stay, they're interested, and every, every year is a new experience for them and they stay with us. So I think it, it's going to be a number of different things that allows us to change. And if we don't change, some of the challenge organizations, certainly for really large-scale organizations, will overtake us, be more innovative, and be more attractive to workforce of the future. Okay. I think, that if I may, I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges for us as an industry, is attracting and retaining that talent. How many Gen Zs are in the room? <laughs> perish the thought. But, but the, these guys are making our strategy decisions in 10 years' time. And are our customers. And are our customers. Now emerging. Exactly. Yeah. So, so th these are the things that are going to strongly influence chemically, biologically, our ecosystem from the outside. And how do we attract them into the industry that has had a lot of common ways of working for a long period of time, where you can spend a long time in the same organization doing the same things, or in the same industry? How many of us have moved within the industry from even from vendor to, to telco, but still in the same space. That's going to be a real serious challenge, is to attract, retain, train, keep them interested in going. We learned a lot through COVID when all these surveys were done about not just the working from home or remote working or hybrid, but actually the type of company I want to work for and what, it's, what it feels like for, to work for them remotely is different, et cetera, et cetera. There's going to be a lot of that even softer stuff. And as a technology industry, we're not really great at a lot of soft stuff. We're standards driven and factually based in bits and bytes. We have to get, it's a real challenge for a HR and a leadership organization to actually build that right kind of dynamic infrastructure for the people agenda. 
Um, mm. And if we lose sight of the people agenda, I think this could be a very bare room in a, in a, in a I, I, just to chip in, I completely agree with that. I, I, I think what, you know, if I was cr to criticise ourselves as an industry, I'd say one thing we're really shit at is thinking about how do we look to people who are not in this industry? And, you know, we just don't look that interesting. You know, it's just boring, right? And, 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 and I've got evidence. <coughs> I mean, so, so my daughter left Durham University and, and joined VMO2 on the graduate scheme, right? She's still there after two years, and she really likes it, right? But her friends go, oh, you know, like, oh, oh, don't worry. Poor you. Know, you. Like, you'll get a proper job. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's like a kind of, they see it. Her peers see it as a sort of shitty consolation prize that she's got, right? And, and, and that's because they don't understand, you know, what this industry does, and they don't understand because we don't tell them. Right? We, don't, we, we don't package it up in the right way. They want to work for Google or Meta or, you know, just there's a ton of companies that are more attractive than, you know, 3 or Vodafone or O2 or BT. There's just tons of them. And, and we just need to do a better job of saying this is what we do. You know, this is the good we do in the world and this is how we do it. And it's actually, it's pretty cool what we do. It's interesting, right? It's interesting, rewarding and challenging. And we just don't do that. But I'll give to one, one thing to, to say about this transformation that we, we are talking about. I think we, we are two companies. That one, one is the company that, uh, that is the optimization of the connectivity and all the better services and give it this, make it a, in a strong way and resilience in that way. And the other way is improving new services to right targeted to the customer that are very disruptive. And, and I think there are, even though they are the same company, they, they, they will be they will work in, in different ways. And I think the, we have to construct this infrastructure to make very tiny companies inside the company, like that are allowed it to fail safe, and to do the job like like uh, an, an, any startup that had, had to be done, and maybe your daughter can do the startup inside of O2, Vodafone, or, or Telecom Argentina, sure, sure. and and make the disruption with a tiny investment, not a big investment. Tries, fail safe, yeah. and and maybe evolve and scale. Yeah. I think this is the. I think I, 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 this is what I want for for uh, the, the the part that is very engaged with the customer for, from the B2B market. That is what I am doing right now, but also for the B2C market. Uh, but each market at the same, maybe partnership with others. Yeah, that's that's another partnership is another thing too. And that we have to work a lot yeah. in this agile world. No, that's that's interesting and, and great points there. And Scott, if I just come back to you before we go to the room for any questions. Is the nature of how the teams within Vodafone uh, changing? Are this, is it still the same kind of teams? Are they working in the same way? Is it smaller teams, bigger teams? I know you're trying to get a sort of pan-European developer workforce. Is, are they working in, in tiny groups and then coming together in some way? How's sure. That so the, the point Graham makes is 100% spot on. It, it, attracting people into our industry versus hyperscale is really hard. We're trying to solve that by saying we're a European telco. You can work on European scale. You can work on projects across all of these markets. And we've organized ourselves around domains as a, as a single organization to help attract the talent that, that fits within that. The other key piece is actually keeping that talent is really hard. Because as you move from a pure network company to a software engineering company, in, in a pure network company, people went to other operators or they went to vendors. It's quite a small ecosystem. and it's, you, you find lots of people that have been in networks for 20 years, 25 years. They've stayed in the same company, the same vendor for that period. In software, it's totally different. P people stay for three, four years. Your competition is everybody. Hyperscalers, banks, anyone that's looking for engineering and digital talent. So you, you have to be constantly thinking about your employee brand, why people want to work there, and focus on that. And our industry needs to work on being sexy, being a place to work. We have brilliant graduate programs. My kids are just finishing university. The, the telco graduate programs are way better than many of the other programs. Yeah, they're just, uh, the, uh, they're just not that excited right, about that, the that's, technology. That's absolutely true. Like once you're in, you know, the, once you're in a, a telco like Vodafone, I think it's a really rewarding experience. And I think at, you know that the actual experience that people have working inside probably the same for BT as well. The actual experience people have is quite good. Um, 
But the problem is you've got to get them in in the first place. You've got to get them to want to come and work for you in the first place. And that's where we're really falling down, I think. And so very quickly, before we go to the room, Dan, how, uh, how can you make companies like BT even more sexy and attractive for people oh to come with? Uh, well, uh, I, think, I think the aspiration perhaps would be at least get it to neutral, because I think you're right at the moment. Um, it perhaps isn't, it isn't seen in that way, shape or, at all. I came out of industry. I joined from banking and financial services until I joined BT about four years ago. And I joined not knowing half the amazing stuff we and other telcos get involved in and can do. So I think there's something incredibly simple around better communication, better advertising of the scale and the breadth of what, what, what our industry can do. Because I had no idea, and I still don't think we talk about it enough, because I do think when they get inside, actually her answer might well be, I love my job, and these are the interesting things I do. And people outside have no idea. And you're right, you can go and work in a many different industries now that will be more interesting and more exciting. And so there's an opportunity for us to strike while the iron's hot on that. The other thing I'd like to mention is, uh, you know, it's not lost on me, we are a very lacking in diversity panel sitting up here. <laughs> and, um, or visible diversity, should I say, because yes. that, that, that's, that, that's important. But I think equally we've got to think about that for the future, because our workforce of the future absolutely wants to see that. Um, but our workforce of the future is also going to include people at the other end of the spectrum who aren't ready or don't want to or can't retire. And as a multi-generational workforce, it's, that's not just reskilling, but that's maintaining a focus on those individuals. Why would they want to stay with us? And if they've got great skills and an ambition to do something different with us, we should be open to them doing that as well. Okay, great point. Um, so now I'm just going to go to the room and see if anybody has got uh, any questions at this point. Okay, I can see a number of hands up uh, around the room, but I can only see so much of the lights in my face, so I'm going to leave it <coughs> roving microphones to, to get to somebody. In the meantime, can I just remind everybody to vote in the poll uh, to get those numbers up? Um, and uh, the, the poll is online on Telecom TV website. Now, have we got somebody... Uh, over here, yes, okay. If you can uh, tell us who you are, where you work, and what your question is, please. Um, hi, Maria from Weaver Labs. We are the strange ones in the room. We're a startup um, in the telecoms industry. So I fundamentally agree with what Graham was saying. It is, it's not sexy. It's incredibly hard to hire talent in this industry, even from a startup, <laughs> even being the cool kids developing software for the industry. Um, one of the things that we have done is taken the model of the Web3 industry. It's incredibly complicated what they do, but they attracted all of the young people because they understand what the value sits on them and for them. And they invest and they, from the corner of their houses, they develop software for the Bitcoin network, for the Ethereum network, and so on and so forth. So one of the things that I haven't heard any of you talking about is your marketing budgets to attract talent. Because as you all said, these are going to be the future of your customers, but also we need to educate these people on what is the value of telecoms for them. For example, we just opened a Telegram channel because the Gen Z is on Telegram. It's not on LinkedIn. And Every week we post what are we doing and what, how does it influence them in their connectivity daily. It's incredible the feedback that we get about how little they understand of what we do and how it links to their everyday lives. But that comes from marketing budgets. That means having a social media content manager <coughs> that builds that into your content strategy and as much as we are attracting customers, we attract talent that way. So I would like to hear your views on, on having conversations with your TRIF marketing officers and, and, and what's the, the, the point on, on doing that. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Maria. Anybody up here got a recruitment marketing budget? And anybody up here <laughs> heard of a recruitment yeah. marketing budget? Actually, it's a, it's a fantastic point. The, how you build your employee brand and how you link that to your purpose and why people want to work for your company is super, super important. It's not easy to convince your consumer team to give up their marketing budget for the next iPhone launch to, to help you through that process. We actually funded ourselves because ultimately we're the beneficiaries of that talent. So we took some of the savings we make through insourcing, engineering capabilities, and we, we use that to fund our employee brand 
uh, capabilities. I also don't think it's a marketing function. If you want to attract engineering talent, you need your best engineers to be going to the, to, the, to the employment fairs. They need to be talking to the teams. They need to be talking at external events and making people excited about the organization. If you leave it to your marketing teams, they, they, they talk about it in marketing terms. That's just not that. Uh, it doesn't do as, as good a job of attracting the talent, but you're 100% right. It, it has to be a key focus on how you build that brand, and it has to be well-funded, or, or you won't attract the right talent. Okay, Christian. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Scott was saying. <clears throat> I think it's about everybody getting engaged. You see, from, from a community like TIP, it really is not about the organizations or the companies speaking. It's the individuals sharing their views. And that is an interesting angle to everybody who kind of is thinking of enjoy, and, and joining and engaging. So I think I agree. For sure, you need to kick it off and you need to have somebody, some funding to get things going. But I believe it's not about money. It's about engagement, starting with ourselves around this table, by the way posting and having an opinion. Okay, Dan and then Coleman. Yeah, I, I think there's another piece in here around once you've attracted that talent, what you do with it once you've got it, uh, and the flexibility that you offer, because the traditional contract of employment that we have in most of the Western world is going to shift. Sitting at home working for organizations might happen when you're not actually an, an employee in the sense of the word that we would understand it. Um, and, and equally, once people are with you, they have to want to stay with you for a period of time. So uh, you've got to make them sticky. So it's not just the attraction piece, although I get your point, uh, having the budget to do it's hard. But by the way, recruitment's really expensive, and people need to re remember that in an organization. I think often it's the first thing that gets cut, and things like advertising and going out then become even more important because you've got to spend that money really wisely. And I entirely agree. Our best efforts are put into getting it technical people in front of uh, talent immediately so that they buy into what they're doing. They don't need to talk to HR, they don't need to talk to a recruiter, they need to talk to someone who's going to do and develop them in what they are coming to do at the business. Okay. Yeah, Marie, I think it's, it's, it's a great point. I happen to be lucky enough to work for a large tech organization with one of the largest marketing budgets, I think, in the B2B and B2C industry. And I can honestly tell you that it doesn't make that much difference having that much dollar spent because we can leverage tremendous Dell activities online, shows, exhibitions, its brand itself, its channel, fantastically. It's not attracting telco talent. We started the telco business three years ago, two years ago, just over two years ago, we had 200 people. We've now got 1,600 people. Um, about 1,200 of those are hired externally. And I can honestly say about 80% of those have come from word of mouth, people who know people, because this industry is very insular and we all know each other in doing it. The second part then is keeping the people. So we tracked them in on a telco agenda, a startup within a large organization. I mean, it's a brilliant dream to get a phone call and be sold on, hey, there's going to be a billion dollar investment in a startup inside a hundred billion dollar organization. Are you interested? Loads of hands go up. It's fantastic. You get them in and they're like, what are you going to do that's different? How, what is going to be interesting and exciting that I wasn't doing where I was before? We've attracted them from all the big names in the industry, from telcos, from NEPs, from um, IT equipment manufacturers, all the industry but you have to give them a dream that they are following and show them the ambition to go get there. We're not short on the ambition. We haven't lost any staff pretty much. I can count on just over one hand the number of people in two years we've lost from all those people that we've recruited. Um, but our job is now to retain those and deliver on that promise, on that ambition, and then get that word of mouth. Totally agree with Scott on that. People talk to people in their same industry. They relate to people in their same roles. Uh, an, an ad is not going to get you the best engineering talent. Engineers talking about engineering and what we're doing is. And that is one of the things I think we have to do is fundamentally put our engineers to work as recruitment agents within the industry to start getting some of the people they can on board. Okay. But, but working as part of a wider community as well, because it's not only about the engineering talent. We're, as we move out into using more open technologies, there's that whole community vibe that needs to come in, which isn't typically something that comes up from engineering. So it's how do those two different mindsets work and participate together? And by doing that, working closely together, you can start to promote the brand of the organization much wider. Okay, we're going to take one more uh, quick question uh, over here and get a couple of responses, and then we're going to move on because uh, we've got a pretty tight agenda. So over here. <clears throat> Hello, Ray. Um, fantastically exciting panel. I, I have a, we talk about tech calls, and this is where I'm Neil McCray from uh, Juniper Networks. I, I can't help but wonder, if you were to get the technical leadership of the, th I don't know, the five top telcos in a room, and you were to get the technical leadership of Google and AWS, and Red Hat and a few others, 
and you were to have a hackathon, who do you think would win? <laughs> and I can't help but think, if you want to be, look, there's one of my heroes, a guy called Urs Holtz. <clears throat> um, hands up if you know who he is. He's the guy that invented Google, right? Um, he's a seriously talented, he's one of the most talented engineers I've ever met in my life. And he would, on his own, he would probably write better code in a hackathon than the rest of the team. And I can't help but think is, we talk about culture and we talk about all the things related to culture. What about ourselves? And are we the right people to be leading this industry in the future? And how are we measuring that? And how are we challenging that? Because, you know, we, we talk about open. Let me tell you, I started the first ISP in the UK in 1992, and the whole thing ran on open software. The internet is the most open platform in the world, right? But we're talking about things not being open. And, and it just makes me think, are we focused on the right thing? Are we focused on what customers want and the services they want, rather than tinkering in the engineering room that isn't probably going to make that big a difference to our return or the investments that we make? Just a point of view. Uh, a, a point, but let's turn that into a very quick question because is the is the makeup of the team changing at Vodafone, for example, as this uh, uh, new engineering force, developer force, is, is growing? Is the skills balance changing within Vodafone? Absolutely. First of all, building a proper technical career path so the people making decisions are actually engineers, not not professional managers, which is mostly how telcos are run. You, you, you go up through the career path and that's how you, and, and rebalancing that and then giving them the, the vehicle to make those decisions. In, in our world, Santiago Tenorio, for instance, runs our, our network strategy in Open Round. It's his engineering team making the decisions on the directions that we take in Open Round and the investments that we want to make and why we believe that's the right thing for, for an industry. And we've empowered them as engineers to make those decisions, not the, tr the typical approach of business case and, and managerial decisions. It may be wrong, and, and I, know, I know Neil's views on, on open round. It may not be the right decision. We think it's the right thing for the, for the industry, and we think engineers need to lead that if we're going to drive that capability. Same thing in our cloud transformation. We've done joint product development with Google, with AWS, with Microsoft, and I think we do have the talent to work with them and partner and do the right things together, but we have to get the managers out of the way and let the engineers make the decisions on the direction that we're going to go. Okay, excellent. Right, well, we're going to move on uh, at this point with uh, a few more uh, talking points uh, for this session. Um, and we're going to come down to, uh, you know, we can't be too insular uh, in, this, in this journey from telco to techco. So what can be learned from other sectors, from other verticals, if anything? Uh, are, are companies in other industries going through the same kind of transition? I just want to get your view first, and Chris, I'll come to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um we need to get over the, the mindset that if you want, in, if you're in telco, you need to hire telco people. We've had a lot of success hiring from banking and finance, uh, government services, hyperscalers, from vendors themselves. Telco is not that hard. It doesn't take that long to learn. And, and we have a language of our own. But actually, you want that talent and experience from other industries to really balance out uh, what you already have within your organization. OK. Chris, are you getting the sense? Uh, do you see the, the telecom sector starting to learn from you know, more gen generic, uh, the bigger IT industry? I mean, we're seeing it certainly from a lot of the high-tech organizations, whether that's financial markets, technology from there. They're having to release new products much more quickly um, than they used to in a similar manner to telcos. But also, if we look at um, retail, retail's had to go through a huge transformation recently, and a lot of the skills and mindsets from the retail organization are, are coming into um, how they can create products and become more digital as well. So there's lots of those types of parallel industries which, which are useful to look at. Um, but really, where I've seen the most excitement is from industrial, whether that's automotive, um, where they're looking at how they can expand the use of the platform that they've currently got to add new value-added services, whether it's a car that you need to pay extra every month for air conditioning or, or whatever. So, so those are all starting to adapt, and they're all building that based on a, a foundation where they're exposing APIs and um, allowing third parties to develop products in areas that they traditionally wouldn't have done. Okay. Uh, Graham, if we can come to you on this, because um, you work at a company that has 
that's in a lot of different yeah. verticals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is there, are you seeing any kind of transition going on in any other part? Uh, absolutely, 100%. So <clears throat> the, biggest, um, the biggest area for Hutchison in terms of this kind of transformation is in its ports business. So, so we're the third largest container ports operator in the world. And um, the, the transition to digitization uh, industry 4.0, whatever you want to call it, automation in that industry uh, and in our business and, and in the wider industry is incredibly fast and, and m actually much, m relatively speaking, it's a much bigger transition that's happening than is in the telecoms industry because they're starting from a much lower base uh, and moving ahead very, very quickly. So it, it's incredibly exciting, but also for them very challenging too, right? Because it's... it's uh, uh, worrying, I think, for the workforce, uh, unless you manage it properly. Um, it's very challenging. There are lots of challenges around um, I, the, 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 um, the intersection of what they call uh, IT, which we understand as being IT, but then they have OT, operational technology, which is you know control of big machinery and stuff like that. Those things are being kind of smushed together, and that creates a lot of challenges around governance and security and, and, and control and so on, which, which, which they're dealing with right now. But it's a really, really exciting time uh, f for that industry. And as much as we are helping to facilitate that through you know, private 5G and all of that good stuff, we're also learning from them as well because we're seeing you know, that they're, they're, they're tackling problems that in the round, which, which we don't necessarily see in the round ourselves. So it's a really, really interesting experience. Okay. Uh, and yes, Alfred. Oh, well, in, in my own personal life, I have the, the chance to, to have uh, friends in, in, the, in, the, in the oil industry, and they are very involved in that. And there is a big movement in, in the last couple of years in Argentina because of uh, in the exploration way. And, uh, in this big transform, transition, I think we, we could transition to agility, working with agility. That is, I think, is the main uh, target of this digital transformation to, to get the, the goals achieved. Uh, I, I think uh, one, one of the main uh, industries that have been doing this transformation was that one with uh, uh, starting with ExxonMobil with, did it uh, a very great job and I, I use this uh, sample because usually we think ourselves as thick companies that cannot move, that get uh, very stiff to, to move and uh, there, there is nothing more than more stiff or stiffer, I don't know how to say uh, than digging a hole in the middle of the ocean <laughs> and, uh, and they are starting to do it in an agile way Obviously, they don't make an agile tube, but they take uh, agile decisions and then they're making much better decisions than in, in, in the past. And for example, in Argentina in particular, uh, they lost many businesses because of not being agile. Uh, that is, uh, but other agile organizations did uh, the right way and they did it much better in, uh, in achieving the goal of uh, getting the business done. And, and also digging the, the holes and working uh, on, the, on the subject. And you know, when I, when I travel to La Pampa, because uh, I, I am from the middle of, uh, of the center of Argentina, where there is just cattle, and, uh, and when I drive uh, my, my car to, to visit my, my, my dad and, and my sisters and stuff, I, I, I see a lot of uh, trucks going with very thick tubes and they are very investing heavily in that industry, and they are doing it in a agile way of doing things. So I, we can take a look. We can take also a look at Amazon. That uh, does mm -hmm. not dig any holes, yeah. but uh, they are doing many other things good also. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, any good examples from from other sectors that uh, you're seeing? Yeah, Christian. Yeah. So I think this transformation we are facing, which is fundamentally coming from openness software cloud is impacting any sector, any industry. So nobody can sit still. We heard the oil industry as an example. I think what I wanted to just highlight, which is particular for our sector, is mission criticality. Yeah. Um, yes, everything is important and people do at scale, but I think we in this industry have, you know, I would say something comparable to airline industries. 
in terms of the impact of what we do or what we don't do. And I think it just actually makes it more interesting. I mean, we have to go through this transformation, but we do have to have particular, take particular care on the impacts. We need to think in advance, while at the same time dare to make change, right? So that kind of makes it coming back to how to attract the brightest minds. I think this would attract the brightest minds, that you have all this impact, you need to make the change, but you need to understand the consequence. So I think it's good to look around. And you might find those compar comparable industries from very interesting areas, whether it's oil or, or big container ports. But let's remember what is particular to our mission, which is to deliver connectivity anytime, anywhere. Absolutely. We can learn from others, but I guess other, other sectors are also learning from the yes. uh, communications industry as well. Um, now, I mean, what kind of impact uh, for, for the companies that are already starting to, to, to change the way they work, who they hire, uh, and how they operate, what, what kind of change is it, impact is it having on day-to-day -day, uh, operations for the telcos making this kind of move? Dan, if I can start with you, because obviously we're just a few days after quite a massive announcement from BT, um, you know, over a sort of, you know, a seven, eight year period, there's going to be an awful lot of change at that organisation. And some of that is coming just from a, the, the end of some uh, big contracts, but some of it is also coming from a shift in the way that the company is going to work. Um, how is that starting to manifest itself right now? Uh, well, look, I think it, it's relatively early days because, as you rightly point out, lots of people didn't. Uh, it is over a much longer period of time. It's certainly not immediate, and, and we'd never be able to move to that uh, in a short period of time. We are already experiencing major changes in terms of the digital colleague experience, customer experience that's being delivered across the BT organization and, and across the industry. And all of our lives are touched by that technology in more ways than lots of us even realize and have been for a long time. You, you log into streaming services, you log into a banking app, the way you interact with utilities changes. So it's already happening. And I think the key thing um, for the changes that are going on for us is, it, is it's about a change in our strategy and our priorities. We've got a major build going on at the moment that requires lots of people to do that. And over a period of time, the number of people required to deliver that will shift and change, but it will be relatively gradual. It's absolutely built into the, the plans that we've put in place. And a major part of that is going to be looking at the reskilling agenda and looking at our colleagues that want to stay with us or want to stay in the industry. What does that mean for them? But also answering the question for those that don't want to. Uh, what, it, what is our answer going to be for those colleagues? How do we give them some confidence and some surety around the future? They might go and have a second career doing something entirely differently. It could be... Uh, adjacent to us, it might not be uh, at all. Um, and we've got uh, now quite a lot of work to think about what that looks like. Skills and workforce of the future is quite a difficult issue to get your head around. I don't think anyone does it particularly well, actually, um, but it's certainly something that we're focused on. Yeah, but you can't ignore it. That's the main thing. You can, you've got to be doing something about it. And, and at Vodafone, Scott, how are things changing already in terms of the way that things are working on a day-to-day -day basis? The biggest change is, is velocity, just the sheer volume of work. I'll just take a simple example. I'll use the Vodafone UK, Opco. We do a release on our core financials SAP every week. We do a BSS release every three weeks, and we run three releases in parallel. We do 250 digital releases a month. So that volume of change, and thanks to the TSRs, we have to patch everything every month. Now, the, the sheer volume of change that you're driving through the organization means you have to have DevOps. You have to have an integrated chain. Everything has to be automated. You have to have a real focus on site reliability engineering so that you can roll back effectively. The old days of weekend change windows where systems went down for eight hours doesn't exist anymore. We do releases in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, on, because weekend trading is much more important now than than in weekday training in many cases. So you, you're fundamentally changing the way you operate the organization, the processes that sit behind that, and you have to invest in that engineering capability, the operations capability. In our world, it's come from operations. The biggest adopters of DevOps were not the engineering community, they're the operations community. Because yeah. it's pretty boring patching a server every day. They want to invest in observability. They want to invest in the automation. Give them the tools and the coding capability. They'll build your SRE capabilities for you. Let the engineers focus on new features and capability. That velocity change is, is, is a big step change for everybody. And as it permeates through all of your technology stack, everyone has to keep pace with, with, with that change. Okay. And, and that's 
this is something that's changed in the course of two years or three years? Or? No, I think it's been a, a journey. We started in 2017, our move to Agile and starting to adopt. And we started in digital channels, so e-commerce and, and websites. And then we realized, <coughs> actually, all the delays were in our BSS system. So we used to release quarterly. That meant you couldn't do many digital releases because you were waiting for the BSS to deliver the features. You had to move to much more agile mechanisms. And we learned we had to push agile as far back into the organization as we could. It wasn't just about my Vodafone app and the website. Um, you need to do it across the whole technology stack. OK. And uh, Graham and Alfredo, are, are, are things changing? I mean, not necessarily that, you know, I mean, Vodafone has kind of been pushing at this for quite a while, but are, are things changing, changing slowly within your organisations, Alfredo? Yeah, but I can speak of, of what is happening to myself and, and the group. And uh, I think, I think uh, and, and what I see all, all over, and, and, and I think there is a very hard push on, uh, on uh, becoming uh, a learning community of, of, of uh, people because we are going to be shifting uh, the, the, um, the technologies and shifting the markets we are we we going, going. We, uh, we are going to partner with someone that someone uh, still is, is in that move also. So uh, there is a, a lot. Um, a big part, portion of our careers as, as salespeople, as engineering people, that will be devoted uh, explicitly to to learning in different ways, not a structure, not a structure, I guess more more non-structured one, but uh, but still it's, it's going to be a, an investment of uh, that is had to be taken uh, into account every every time more than in the past. Because the engineering is always a, a learning thing, a learning living thing. But uh, I think now is, uh, we have to invest. We are investing, but we have to invest more in, even in, in that uh, direction. Okay. And Graham, things changing on a on a day to day basis. Uh, well, yeah, but slightly, in a, perhaps in a slightly different way for for my team. So, um, because we're a we're a specialised team in sort of looking at. Uh, private networks and industry 4.0. So we're not very big, but one of the really interesting things that, that we do, uh, which I think uh, is, is really valuable, is to put engineers in front of customers, right? I mean, most of the time in big telcos, engineers don't meet customers, right? But, but we can do that. We can, we can put an engineer in front of a big container port or in front of a car manufacturer or whatever, you know, they can, they can have a dialogue and they can have that direct communication. And there's something, the immediacy for them of seeing, you know, this is what the customer actually does. This is what the customer actually wants to do. This is why they want to do it. And then they can take that back into our team. And, and, and it, that, that, that we're shortening the distance, I guess, between the customer and the people who actually make it happen. Um, and that's really, really exciting, I think. But then the other thing that's changing is that in the world that we operate in, most of the time we don't compete. We do compete with other telcos, but, but the big competition is not from telcos. So the big competition is from systems integrators like Accenture and Capgemini and so on. <laughs> and they're bringing more to the party than just connectivity, right? They're bringing a whole suite of partnerships, applications, ecosystems, and so on. And, and it's not enough for us to go, oh, right, well, yeah, we're the, like, we can do a really good 5G network for you. That's not enough, right? And, and, and so, so our customers are saying, yeah, well, that's fine, but you know, like, the, we're looking for a, a much more complete set of solutions. And so building those partnerships and gaining those skills and sometimes hiring people from our competitors' space to, to supplement our team also changes the dynamic of internal dynamic for us uh, uh, and the way we think about ourselves and what we do and so we're yeah it's it's really really different it's really different i can't tell you how different it is being inside our team to being inside a, a bigger telco it's just a totally different gig right and that's a completely different type of conversation. Maybe some of the reskilling is how to talk to customers without frightening them. Or, well, yeah, or without being frightened yourself. Yeah, well, yeah. Right. So, uh, I mean, customers are quite scary sometimes. And, and they <laughs> want commitment. I mean, that, that's the other thing. You need, if, you, if you put uh, 
the, the, the system architect in front of the customer. You know, the customer says, right, well, are you, you know, I want you to do this, right? <laughs> and and th they're not used to being put in that position in front of a customer who's going, I want this, right? So, so, so it does take a bit of, uh, yeah, coaching and, and um, uh, but, but it's fun, you know, it, and it's incredibly rewarding for the people on the team because, because they've never had those kind of experiences before. Okay, excellent. Um, now, we're going to uh, go to the floor again in a second to see if there's any questions, but we've got a question from our online audience. Uh, so I'm just going to read that out now here from my monitor. And the question is, will developing in-house capability inside techcos create interoperability issues leading to the non-standardization of technologies? So I guess this, it's really about if you're doing a lot more development in-house. This is a super, super important point and it's a really well thought through question because yes, it is a significant risk that, that this would happen. It's why the industry forums and bodies are so important, TM forums, ODA, the Kamara Initiative for Network APIs, the work that TIP's doing, those ecosystem control bodies to standardise what we can and the APIs we use is super, super important to not lose the benefits of scale that come with that, but to enable the, the ingenuity and the, and the entrepreneurship that we need to be able to move forward at much greater pace uh, than probably our traditional standards bodies have. But we all, as an industry and an ecosystem, have to be super mindful of this. Okay. So does that make industry bodies like TIP, TM Forum, uh, more important now in, in helping to keep the industry sort of on track and keep it honest? In my view, yes. And, and it's not just operators that need to actively participate, but vendors, ecosystem partners, everyone needs to contribute. And the ones that do should, should hopefully win a bigger part of the, the pie that we build in that particular space. But it's important that we work together to make that happen. Okay. But as a, as a vendor in the ecosystem, the, in order to deliver on the promise of open, then that open system has to be relatively common. So you know, there, isn't, there isn't, in the last 20 years, there isn't a Cisco, Juniper, Nokia, Ericsson, um, Sienna piece of equipment that doesn't have a special piece of code or kit or hardware for a given telco or operator. So all those people are having to maintain those things, even though the interoperability between the telcos is working, but for specials. But if the open system, if x86-based systems, et cetera, are going to work, telcos may need to be a little less specific and a little more open in terms of those tech requirements would be one of my things to look at. That's a constant discussion and I fully agree <laughs> with you. <laughs> uh, and Chris, before we come to the question from the audience, is this a conversation that's, that's happening at, at Red Hat? Absolutely, within, specifically within the standardization bodies and the, the forums like the TM Forum and, and Kamara. Um, it, they become really important. And when you can collaborate as part of those initiatives, working with champions such as Vodafone to, to build out uh, a, a proof of concept or a test bed of how these pieces work together, and, but not only have them as proof of concepts and trials, but have a, a roadmap for what's next and how they actually get into some sort of production type of environment um, also becomes important too. Okay, excellent. Right, I think we're going to take a very quick question from the audience, and then actually we're, we're kind of running out of time a little bit, but if we can have, uh, yes, your name, Francis, where you're from, and your question. Francis Hayes from Apple Door Research. Um, I've heard a lot today about in-source bringing things in, but um, I'm, I'm just wondering how much is partnership important to you in creating the, uh, the, the tech co? Because I'm, I'm getting a sense of a very insular message of sort of, we need to bring it all in-house, we're going to do it all. And how much of that is actually driven by what remains a major issue for telco, which is a fairly uh, zero-sum game procurement process that kind of almost rips up those partnerships as soon as it, it, it comes down to uh, you know, making a commercial deal? Great, great question. First of all, on, on insourcing, most telcos are something like 80% outsourced, 70% if they've got their own teams. Primarily, they rely heavily on outsourcing. When I say insourcing, I'm not proposing to flip that to 80% insource, 20% outsource. Even if you got to 50-50, that would be an amazing position in terms of having your own engineering talent and building the right partnership. So partnerships and vendor partnerships are going to be critically important. Partnerships with SIs and the way you build those is, is going to be important. Your question around changing the procurement process away from pure unitary cost or to a roadmap 
is super, super important. We're running a, uh, an SI consolidation process to try and create longer roadmaps so that we, we award business for longer periods of time on specific domains to a small number of partners so that they can afford to invest over many years to help us improve velocity, to drive unit cost, et cetera, move away from a regular RFP process. There'll always be a role for, for RFPs and tenders and the models, particularly on things that are super standardized or super mature in technology, but we also need to adapt to make sure our partnership models are effective in, in the way that we operate. Okay, great question. Um, now, we do have to be pretty strict on time because we've got uh, an online audience as well and an agenda and uh, other programming as well. So I'm just going to come to the, the final talking point uh, now for the day, uh, which is a pretty important one because we've got on the stage, we've got some very large tier one operators, but of course the telecom, the telco community is made up of a lot of tier two, tier three, even smaller companies. So what happens to the network operators, the communication service providers that either can't make this transition to Techco or don't want to? Um, or is that even an option? Is there an option not to do it in any way? Um, Scott, if we can start with you and then I, I want to get comments from everybody on that. Look, at the end of the day, our job is to offer the best possible telco services to our customers and make our customers as happy as we can. And that's probably by having super reliable networks, super easy services to use, and great online experiences for the way they interact with those and building products that are digital that sit around that. There are many ways that you can achieve that. We happen to believe, for a large telco like us with a large footprint and a complex space, the best way to do that is to make the journey to a techco operating model that will drive operational efficiencies and create new products. You don't have to do it that way. You could have a 100% outsource model. You could partner. You could build everything from someone else. You can still build great experiences for those clients. So there, there'll be a different approach for, for different organizations, depending on their scale, depending on what they're trying to achieve in the market and the breadth of capabilities that they're trying to provide. So do you think that in one way or another, all of the companies that are currently regarded as telcos will get to the techco model in some kind of way simply through natural evolution? I, I, I think it's really hard to, to, to find telcos so narrowly as that there are, there are operators that own infrastructure, there are MVNOs, there are wholesalers, there are over-the-top players. Is, is, is WhatsApp a telco? Well, yes, it offers a messaging service. It's, it's, so I, I, don't, I don't think... They're you, already you, a tech you, you can't. They are, but you can't be so narrow in your definition because the services we provide can be provided in many different ways by many different people. The, and, and the industry will adapt and evolve to, to make that happen in, in many ways, and people have to build an operating model that best suits that. I think if you want to compete on a really broad set of services across lots of segments at real scale, you need to be a tech guy. You need to have your own engineering talent to be able to move at pace, but, but there may be other ways to achieve that goal. Okay. Uh, Christian, let's start with you. Do you think anybody will get left behind? I think there will be different ways. Uh, first of all, I think there's, it's inevitable that the change is happening. So it's no way going back. There will be open systems, disaggregated, cloud-based, software intense, and that requires a different way of dealing things with things. We have the vanguard of the tier ones, like Vodafone, who are driving this change. They've decided to insource and do a lot of that themselves. I think there are other ways. You can buy more of that capability from uh, be it system integrators or various type of partnerships. I still think you need to upskill in order to be able to manage that. And then there's maybe the, the third way that uh, we are in tip working towards is to kind of enable the community to share more of that experience to help those who can't invest as much of their own staff. But I think everybody needs to make part of the journey. I think there's no option to that. That's my view. Okay. Uh, I'm getting the, the, the red light flashing in front of me, so I'm just going to take a couple more uh, comments from whoever wants to uh, pitch in on, uh, you know, will, will anybody left behind? Are there companies that might not make the transition? I think on... I would say probably not in the end. Probably not. Um, but just, just one observation is that the, the, the technology set that we are playing with or that we will be playing with now allows us to slice up and dice up the industry in, in ways, even more ways than, than we have done so far. So, you know, you can, there's, there's tons of exciting things and, and new business opportunities and whether we'll take 
we'll, we'll, we'll take advantage of them, or we'll be startups who take advantage of them, I don't know. But, but, but the, I'm pretty sure that in, when we sit down here and have the same discussion in five or six years' time, you know, there'll be lots of companies in our space that we hadn't really thought of before, and they'll be exploiting these little niches that come through, through the kind of tech code transformation that's, that's happening generally in industry. Okay, thanks, Graham. Cool, Matt, I, very quickly, and then we'll have a look at the poll results. I, I think it's a horses for courses question, because I think all the segmentation that's got talked about in terms of wholesale or this or WhatsApp or whatever it is, valid, Graham's the same point, fixed access versus full operators. We also happen to be very fortunate enough to live in a part of the world where we're leading edge technology all the time. But it's not the same in Africa. It's only evolving in parts of the Middle East. It's not the same down in, in, in Asia Pacific in all places, some highly advanced, some not. I think we're going to see technology on a horses for courses basis. What do you need to provide? If you spend hundreds of millions on spectrum and billions on fiber rollout, you need a return. If you don't have 5G because there's no one who's going to afford to buy that server and the ARPU in a country is two or four dollars, you're going to have a very different type of model and no need to get to that space. I think it's also, let's not look at it also just the markets we're used to. Vodafone plays in some very interesting markets top to bottom in terms of its scale. So I think that's the other thing to remember is how can this technology move at the right pace to bring everyone up where it needs to and how it can. I think that would be the great measure of how it is. Okay, excellent. Okay, thanks everybody. We're nearly at the end of our session, but before we head to our break, well, we just need to check on the viewer poll. So let's remind ourselves of the question and reveal the votes we've received so far. So question is, what will be the hardest challenge for a telco wanting to become a tech co? And uh, we can see attracting and retaining the appropriate staff has so far got the highest number of uh, votes, which is... Uh, uh, but probably not so surprising, uh, but there's an interest, interesting set of results there. This poll is not closed just because this session is ending, uh, by the way, so please do continue to vote and uh, check out the results. Um, so we need to leave it there for now. Don't forget the charity pinball tournament at the far side with Neil McRae. We'll see you back here at 11.15 when Guy and his guests will be discussing operational efficiency and how DSPs can operate at speed and scale. But first, let's show our appreciation for our panelists, please. <laughs>